<laughs> Welcome to Late Night, the science show with Pablo Stanley and friends. Chantal Jandar, product designer at Plan Grid. Gabriel Valdivia, designer at Jigsaw. Jasmine Evian, design advocate at Google. Hello, guys. Welcome. Great to, to have you here. This is the first time we do this. So today, today we're going to be talking about uh, transitioning to product design. So let's just start just by in introducing you because I put that keynote, but uh, I want to actually uh, you introduce yourselves probably. So let's just start with you, Chantal. Hi, uh, YouTube. <laughs> uh, I'm Chantal. <laughs> I'm a designer at Plan Grid. So we build tech for, con for construction, which is a super complex, super fun industry. Um, some of the buildings we've worked on is like SF MoMA in San Francisco, Hudson Yards, New York, all sorts of buildings. Um, I actually came to um, design through psychology. I didn't go to design school. So I can talk a little bit about that later on. That's great. That's great. And so the, the topic is going to be perfect. And um, I, I sometimes wonder if you're all tricking us into get into plan grid. Is it really <laughs> that fun? Because I, I, I want like I, I, I hear like, oh, there's there's going to be grids and it's going you're going to be talking with uh construction people. And it's like that doesn't sound that fun. Oh you my all God. just tricking us. It is super fun. Yeah. No, the construction industry is I so I worked in a little bit in healthcare, a lot of time in education, did like this much in financial, and um it's the most tricky industry I've ever designed for. So in terms of like complexity and uh, if you really love getting like meaty problems, it's super fun. It's also really fun to seeing buildings that you helped with in this much way, you know, go up. And um, it's the people in the construction industry are just so cool and so smart. I've learned so much more about how buildings happen now. It's it's a good time. It's a good time. <laughs> let's let's go with you, Gabriel. What the hell is Jigsaw, man? Jigsaw is an alphabet unit uh, that focuses on communities at risk and tries to come up with uh, technology solutions for those communities. So we end up working a lot with, um, let's say, activists or journalists in developing countries and giving them tools to get their information out there and fight things like censorship or online harassment, things of that nature. Um, so yeah, I've been doing that for a little bit now, and um, but mostly I, I just admire each other's hair. <laughs> <laughs> you guys work in really, uh, really important industries. Like uh, you're, you guys are doing like really important stuff. That uh, I admire. That that's that's really cool. Now, Jasmine, tell us a little bit about you. Jasmine is popular. I don't know if you knew it, but oh she has goodness. a TV show. I'm a design advocate at Google, and essentially, what it boils down to what we do. We do a lot of uh, stuff, but we help external designers build on Google's. Android web um, using Material Assistant AR VR any, anything we we kind of want to make better designers so that's a little bit of what we do um, we do that through a lot of things either content creation uh, as Pablo mentioned I do have a show go check it out at design or yeah Google Design YouTube and it's called Centered so we just released our first episode and we'll be releasing another one this month should be really exciting um, and then in the coming months as well. Uh, yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Um, we come from a UX designer and product manager by trade and actually started doing by doing front end dev. So that's actually how I got into tech. Awesome. Awesome. So today we're going to be talking about uh, transitioning to product design. Uh, and I, uh, I I wonder if there's any people, uh, Edgar, if like if they're asking questions about that, like uh, you can ask us some questions about like uh, uh, if you are transitioning from a specific career or like any tips, like uh, just leave it on the chat and we'll try to answer those questions. Uh, but uh, let's just start with you, Chantal. I, I don't know, like it's really interesting that you are coming from psychology and then now you're working in construction and working on, on solving problems through design. Yeah, so um, going back even farther, I actually started uh, making my own websites when I was a kid in elementary school. So I kind of had like a little bit of a technical background there. And at the time, I thought the, uh, the only job you could have in the web was a webmaster, which I'm probably dating myself by saying that, but <laughs> that, that was like the job you could have. So I kind of abandoned that when I got to high school, ended up going to school for psychology because I was really interested in people and how they think and how they process. Um, and my school is kind of interesting and unique in that you do, um, I went to University of Waterloo and they do four months of school, four months of work, four months of school, four months of work. So you're constantly getting jobs. Um, and so I looked at the job listings for psychology for first years and I was like, oh man, these are all like lab assistant jobs. I already, I've already done that. 
So I look through, I'm like, oh, that one has like HTML and CSS. I know those. I guess I'll uh, do that job. And that was kind of like my first foray into product design. Uh, little did I know it. So in that job, I was doing like A-B testing. I was redoing an AI. Um, and then someone told me product design was a job. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> no one told me this before. I can do that. So I um, started looking more and more into applying the interest I had in what do people need? How do they think? And how can I make things easy based on how they think into the design um, fields? That's dope. Uh, and when you when you said that you were uh, making your website, were you using GeoCities or were you using Dreamweaver? <laughs> oh goodness! Oh, no. Or was it MySpace? Notepad. Were you making websites with MySpace? <laughs> <laughs> I was using Notepad. I was old what? school. What? Oh, I'm impressed. So like, grade four was my first one. Um, I learned how to code HTML and CSS before I learned how to copy and paste. So I used to write it down on paper on my like desk and then from a website and then look down and type it in. <laughs> to note that. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. How, how is that so, impossible? How, yeah. <laughs> how did no one teach you that? I know. No one told me how to copy and paste. I wrote JavaScript. <laughs> Can you imagine typing JavaScript in like missing commas? Like, oh no! Oh. So learned those languages real well, and <laughs> yeah, it was pretty special. <laughs> the secret to getting into development: remove copy and pasting. Oh yes. my gosh! Yeah, and then I got and I got into a uh, PHP and MySQL. Um, no one told me about sanitizing inputs. Yeah, I got hacked real quick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, anyway, <laughs> that was my transition into design. <laughs> there you go. What about you, Gabriel? Uh, you started like a more like in graphic design, right? Yeah, you started like an agency and doing a, a little bit of a print design. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I went to school for graphic design. Uh, so, that's art school. So, I spent years drawing naked people, um, uh, a lot of moves. So, it was great. <laughs> Um, yes, and the idea was to join an agency and you know design the next Nike swoosh and conquer the world. Um, but as soon as I graduated, I kind of, that whole industry became kind of like stuffy to me, and I and I became really kind of enamored with the uh, the tech industry that was happening in Silicon Valley when the iPhone came out, and it just felt like they were making their own rules and. Um, we just feel like uh, like uh, a refreshing new take on what a job could be. Um, so I I slowly transitioned from graphic design to becoming a webmaster um, to you know working on the first mobile apps like back in two thousand eight two thousand nine made some of the worst mobile apps on the app store, <laughs> um, and over time started to get more and more familiar with that world um, uh, until. Um, some at some point I put in product designer as my job title. It it was you. You you named yourself that. You proclaimed yourself a product designer. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I wanted to move to San Francisco so bad that I um I got a Google Voice number with a San Francisco area code and I <laughs> changed my address to San Francisco in LinkedIn or AngelList, one of those. And I just pretended that I lived there. And <laughs> It worked. Wow. That's so <laughs> sneaky. <laughs> so, so you totally uh, 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 preach the whole idea of fake it, fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fake it till you make it for sure. Or like the secret, you know, like you get, you like you visualize it and then it happens. Yeah. I'm picturing so your like you... LinkedIn picture with like a Photoshop Golden Gate Bridge in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so now at Jigsaw, you're helping people not get catfished. Is that you know? <laughs> You're an expert. You're so, yeah, yeah. His internal experience, yes. Now he's trying to make it all right. Um, I know yeah. all the tricks. Nobody can get through me. <laughs> That's good, man. That's good. What about you, Jasmine? Tell us yeah. a little bit about you. How is your transition? Was... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it all started when I was first born. Um, decided I woke up and I was like, I'll be a product designer. No, no. Um, classic, so first classic, baby words. <laughs> classic first baby words. Was it mom or dad? Um, Your umbilical cord was in, <laughs> in eight pixel grid. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no. So I, I got into. I was my degree is actually in web development, but uh, before that, I was studying. Like at one point, my degree was going to be in geology and then history. Like it went through so many different things. 
And how I actually got into like the more tech area is I took a flash class and it was um, the, cause I had to take like a computer class at the community college I was at. And I took this flash class and the instructor was like, hey, you're actually pretty good at this. Have you ever considered this as a career? And I was like, uh, what? Like I, you can do this for a living? You know, I didn't know that was possible. Um, and so that's actually when I did some research and like the a Arizona State University had an internet and web development uh, degree. And so then that's what I started pursuing. So um, I went through that route. So my so my training was less uh, more in the graphic design area, but more in like the dev uh, side of it, which then, you know, doing a lot of websites and web dev, like you're doing it all, which then um, kind of evolved UX. My first like internship was actually at a product design development firm where they did a lot more of like the hardware. And so I was kind of one of the only um, digital people. And so that kind of evolved to doing a lot more of like the UX um, for some of the projects and stuff. Sounds like a, I mean, none of us like got like an actual degree or went to product design school, right? It's just like a, like we landed there like somehow. Like uh, we, there was an interest in web, there was an interest in code, like, there was an interest in, in visual graphic design, and then uh, suddenly, like this became. But should I, there be? Should there I, be like a school? Is, is it like because it, it doesn't sound like a, you you went to product design school or, or did any? I think, of you I think there is though. I think we're all pretty ancient, <laughs> and there's been some schools that have been popped up since we we graduated. Because I I've heard of. Pro product design programs uh, out there right now, but but I mean, but you didn't take that program. It, would you recommend that? How would you recommend? Hey, yes, going to that program will help you, it, because it, it you I, I you are successful. I, I I see you're successful, and you didn't need that. You think that other people need it? I mean, I think that so. The beautiful and frustrating thing about UX design is that so many people come from so many different areas. So, right, you um, people that are more interested in psychology, which really falls in line with what we're building, right? That's you, yeah. Um, or you know the the other aspects of like uh, actually more into like the the visual design and all of that. Like, it's great because you have all these different experiences that are coming together in the industry to create like really really thoughtful um, experiences. But the frustrating part is like, it actually makes it really difficult to actually get a career in this because no, if you go to this four year, you know, college, or if you do this program, like you're automatically going to be this awesome UX designer or product designer or whatever you want to call it, which uh, it, it can be really hard when you're first trying to get in because because the the field no one really defines it it's almost like you have to do it all and so it's hard to understand whether you should be focusing more on the visual side because the companies around you are looking for a more visual type designer that does the ui and ux and all of that or someone that should be focusing more on the code side because they actually want you to build it um i it's i don't know it's kind of this i guess i went through that a bit where it was kind of this hard process of kind of like when I'm trying to get hired, but what what is it that you're looking for? I agree and also disagree at the same time, <laughs> which is great because yours was like the beauty and the downside. Yeah, no, they're <laughs> so it's all a yin yang. But um, thinking back to my education, I think one of the best parts of it was just getting an opportunity to work a ton of different jobs since it was every once we got the chance. Uh, we have an awesome design intern at, at Plan Grid. Well, we have two awesome design interns at Plan Grid, but uh, one of them changes uh, his mind almost every day what career he wants to pursue. So he's a designer right now and he's rocking it, but he's like, maybe a data scientist, maybe a PM. And every one on one, it's like, what do you, what do you think you want to do? And he's like, I think maybe this, think maybe this. Um, so I think it's there's a lot of different kinds of um, uh, paths can lead you to it, but figuring out if product design is for you or if like what you should focus on, you really learn that at the job. Um, and any program that lets you have the opportunity to try that job a bunch of times, different places, I think is more beneficial than almost any classes you can take. Yeah, for sure. I think the hard part is how do you get your foot in the door? That's like the hard part, right? Because everyone, even if the, the quote unquote junior UX designers positions, it's still you have to have like a couple of years experience. And, and it's yeah. just like this really hard thing where a lot of people aren't giving you those experiences. And there isn't this quote unquote formal education that leads you to this. So it's like, how do you even get started? Yeah, sorry, just for context, like the our the way you get work at my school is the the school helps arrange it. Oh, that's cool. So every four months there's like a database of jobs, like over thousands and thousands you just apply to and then you have your job kind of lined up. You have to interview and stuff. Like it's still a competitive process, but like 
there's a, it's called job mine. You just kind of go on and get your job on there. So it kind of helps you do that foot in the door kind of aspect. Yeah. So, cool. so hold on. So like uh, to be hired as a junior designer, you need two years of experience as a junior. <laughs> like uh, what is below being a, like, where were you before being a junior designer? Like, were you just like a, just a what, fetus what are those two years of experience? <laughs> you were Yasmin saying, I want to be a product designer when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> It's... Yeah, there. But but no, that's like I think the reality of the design industry. If you look a lot of the job applicants, like even if they are entry level positions, it's all have parents. Um, and landing, I think those internships can be pretty difficult. So it, it's yeah, I agree with you. Like you really learn on the job. But how do we make it easier for people to get their foot in the door so that they can yeah. learn on the job? I, I suppose like how do you make it easier for uh? For people that have that curiosity and that are also like moving from a different industry and want to get in here but now since the industry i suppose like it's so it's a little bit more established like now we like there's this idea that you have to have that experience uh and, and so then with that is, is that building walls against people that are coming from different fields and are just like 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 chantal that are coming from that didn't have two years of experience as a product designer but she had that curiosity uh, and she had that uh, enthusiasm of, of like getting into it and 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 found it interested. So like we are like almost like uh, uh, blocking ourselves from those amazing people like uh, like Chantal. You know, like is that happening? You think or what? Is it are the programs there are saying like, hey, you know what? Yeah, we we're allow we're allowing people uh, to have that are curious enough and they want to pursue this uh, thing and, and we're going to give them an opportunity. I mean, I think the model that's really interesting to me, um, and Chantel, you kind of mentioned that your school did this, which I thought was great, but it's the, the idea of like, you know, center, center, the, the school that, um, Jared Spool among others, uh, UX practitioners are, are kind of leading the initiative where they do teach you a lot of like the, the methodologies and, you know, doing all that, all that stuff, but as well as actually getting you experience within the industry. Um, Cause I think that's super valuable. And I, I think that model of actually putting things into practice so that it's not so much just like from a theoretical standpoint, but actually from experience, really beneficial. But I mean, I think that, I don't know if they're, I, I don't think that should be the only way to get into product design or UX design. Um, I think that's just the way, I mean, but most jobs as well, right? Like your degree is just one of the ways to get your foot in the door. Um, a lot of people just start doing it, especially within the design field. They just started doing it because they saw maybe Pablo's, uh, you know, live streams and like tried to follow along. So that's kind of the beauty of it too. You can kind of self-teach. You think anyone can become a designer? I believe that everyone is a designer, but we can, oh. that's, that, that's a topic for another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't necessarily, anyways, we won't get into that, but. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I I think I agree with you and in, in, in a sense where it's like anyone can be a designer or anyone is a designer if they have a decision or, or, or yeah, tell us like if, if they have a point of decision in the in the process of building something. I suppose is that where it's coming from? I mean, I think it's more of like, regardless of where you are, if you're helping build a product, um, whether you are an engineer that's you know a front end engineer and you are making sure that animations and tra transitions flow nicely, like if you mess that up, you're going to impact the user's experience because they're going to like feel like this app is going too slow or it's not operating properly. So every, I believe that everyone that touches the product or even has some say in it is in, in part influencing the design. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the ones that are responsible for like the ultimate design. Like I think that also falls on like the, the, the designer, right. To ensure that you're creating this experience. Um, that is great. But I do believe that everyone does impact the, the design. Okay. And now can anyone become a, a designer <laughs> that has a title? <laughs> Not just that that touches a, a part of the product, but actually like a designer. Do you think anyone, it, because I, I hear some people that say like, no, you need talent or you need to uh, uh, a specific type of mind. Is that true? <laughs> what is it? What is it that is required to be a designer? I mean, uh, <laughs> I guess I would say like a uh, uh, collaborative mindset. Um, to be a product designer, like you need to feel comfortable bringing a lot of people into your process. You need to feel comfortable, um, like taking other people's ideas in, doing group sketching, not necessarily being the one with the answer. Um, and I feel like the best designers are the ones who kind of have those that facilitation uh, angling to their work. 
Agreed. I, I, I think <laughs> just be a great well, collaborator. Uh, at least I get, at least people will, will continue wanting to work with you in that sense, even if your design sucks. So I guess that's a good first step. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm interested to hear what everyone else in that, but the collaborative piece, um, being able to kind of work, you know, you got to be able to work well together is because design doesn't exist in a chamber, right? Like, it's not like this thing that you can be by yourself designing and then just be like, here's this beautiful thing, go build it, you know? Um, so, so being able to work with everyone else, I think is equally important as well, as well as, you know, part of product design, UX design is getting a lot of that, um, you know, feedback from your user. So being able to have kind of good communication skills with them is important. Um, I think it's someone that's, that does, I think there is some critical thinking. Like I think at the end of the day, as a designer, your job is to solve problems. Then those may manifest themselves in different ways. So being a good problem solver would, I would say. I think uh, it's just hard to say to, um, exclude anybody from pursuing the, the profession, right? Like anybody, if they want to, they can probably be a designer. Um, I've met some really good designers who are not good team players, you know, who are kind of lone wolves. And I've I've met really good designers who are, are team players. I, I think that, you know, if we're talking about UX design within a team, um, that's a very kind of narrow uh, definition of the word design. There, you know, there are many of designers that um, work in different industries that don't require the same workflows that we're used to. Um, but for, for our industry in UX, I think over time, that, you know, the, the job kind of beats you and teaches you that the only way to move forward is by being a good team player and by letting go of your ideas and, uh, you know, iterating as a team um, as opposed to this idea of the lone artist that goes away into a room for two days and comes back with the right answer. Um, I think I think that, you know, the job has a way of kind of molding you into that person, no matter what your background is. And are, are there other uh, types of designers that where that works, where uh, being the lone wolf works, like as a freelancer or like uh, someone that it works in uh, specifically in graphic design or... Yeah, I mean, so maybe we can uh, I, we can define what we mean by UX, right? UX is a bunch yeah. of different things, and I can think of let's say brand design as something you can do uh, pretty individually. And there are stories of you know Paul Rand, really famous brand designer. Uh, he designed the next logo for Steve Jobs back in the day, and the story I don't know if it's a myth or not, but the story is that. Um, he met with Steve Jobs and he said, okay, the logo will cost you $1 million and we'll come back, you know, three months later or whatever, and I'll give you one option and that's it. And he did. Um, and, and like, that is the, the, you know, in school you fantasize that idea of like, yes, like I, I know best. And then the clients will, you know, succumb to me. Um, so I'd imagine he just goes into whatever his process is, comes back and he's like, here you go, here's the best logo you can possibly ask for. And um, and that's a very different process than what we're used to in product design, right? Um, so I imagine there are other kind of uh, arms of design that, that have a, a different process. Yeah, there's something you said there that's like really interesting. Um, again, you come from a design school background, so maybe you, you can comment on this too. Like I have other friends who came from like traditional art kind of backgrounds. And they always tell stories about how their professor would kind of walk through and just like rip some pieces off the wall and go, that's trash show. What did you even do? And just like this like hyper aggressive style of critique. Whereas when yeah. you come into product design, UX design, uh, critique is not like that usually, you know, like safe, psychologically safe work environment. Uh, usually it's a little bit more like, hey, I see you did this. Uh, tell me more about your thinking. What what were you exploring there? What problems were you solving? What constraints were you working with? Like, let's talk, let's like, solve this problem together. It's a very, uh, a different approach. Chin, when you were saying like different kinds of design and I thought that came to mind and I was like, man, can those even be called like the same like uh, industry yeah. almost because they're so yeah. different. <laughs> it's not a I, I have I have memories of you know um, designing like my my professor telling me you need to do a hundred logos and I spent like hours coming up with a hundred logos or whatever it is then showing it to him and and he's just like okay do it again. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think art school. 
<laughs> well, I think that comes from 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 this kind of unspoken rule that in the art world, an artist knows best, right? And this this dynamic between artist and its audience is very different between a designer and its users. Um, like an artist has a background and a perspective that is unique, and that is what makes their work valuable. Um, whereas a design the designer's perspective is almost useless. Um, a designer is a facilitator. They they visualize ideas and then they uh, present them to a crowd of users and they decide what's better. And that's that's a very different distinction from you know I'm an artist I know best and and if you don't if you don't agree then you don't you don't understand me you know. Those are called creative directors. <laughs> I'm yeah. just teasing to all my creative directors out there. I'm just kidding. How did you like go about making that tradition for yourself when you were going from graphic design? Well, uh, I think I I have a, a slightly different perspective on art. I think that art um, is meaningless unless it ignites a conversation with its audience, um, and unless you, you know, if you create whatever piece of art, if if it's not complete until it interacts with it, its audience. Um, so, I, and I know a lot of people disagree with that um, perspective. So, so I think maybe that makes me a bit unique in the sense that I was already kind of craving that interaction between creating something and uh, you know showing it to a bunch of users or or, or some sort of audience for that. Um, so it was a natural kind of transition for me into creating products that people use and. And by using the products that I made, that was my interaction with an audience. And that, that was my opportunity to find ways to like delight people and, and uh, influence behavior and things like that, things that you dream of as an artist. I think that was kind of what I uh, gravitated towards. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to move on to another section and uh, another section with news. <laughs> so, okay, so simple. Simplices, simplice, simplici, simplice, simplice, <laughs> new <Simplice>? logo. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, I don't know if uh, you use uh, simplice. Boom. Uh, simplice is a, it's, a, it's like a WordPress site builder, uh, almost a little bit like a Squarespace. And it's by Tobias Van Schneider. And he, ju they just changed their logo. And actually, this was designed by Mackie Saturday. Uh, so I, I want you to just see the before and after. And I, just like I see the after, and it's uh, it's pretty good. It's, it's beautiful. But I see the before, and I never noticed the, the actual logo before. And I and I see it as like, oh my god, well, what was going on? <laughs> but but I don't know if it was if it is because the after is so good, and then you compare it, and you realize like, oh man, the the, the one before was like. There was some weird things going on there. It, it almost looked like it was designed by Napoleon Dynamite, uh, but the new <laughs> one, it's it's beautiful. So yeah, so you can see the uh, new branding. It's it's pretty much just like the same stuff. They just changed the logo. So uh, this was designed by Mac Saturday, and it's pretty good. Also, uh, Keyframes, which is a, a new uh, site by Pascal. I don't remember his last name. And it's only, it's like a community for animators. And so I invite you to, oh, apparently, see, there's uh, some stuff that is mine too. But it's just like different animators just sharing their stuff and just like discussing and sharing tips. It's a pretty cool community. You should check it out. Also, dark patterns. I was reading about dark patterns. Like they're so, uh, they're so in today, right? Talk about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And it's uh, apparently uh, uh, Amazon, somebody got me mad at Amazon because they wouldn't be able to uh, uh, put a review unless it was more than four stars. Uh, so check out those dark patterns. And also uh, Framer just released uh, Framer X. I don't know if you noticed uh, this new tool. It's, uh, it's promising uh, bridging the gap between the developer and the designer a little bit closer uh they have uh like everything that you design in it is actually on react which is which is uh it's, it's good it's it's almost like uh where you're going to be designing is not just an, an image is actually going to can be used in implementation so uh check it out too for those lucky enough to have a, a an invite because right now it's just an invite only beta and also mailchimp 
released a, a new game called Post Haste, and it's pretty much like Paperboy. I don't know if you played. <laughs> I don't know if you're old enough to, that you actually played play Paperboy on Nintendo. That was one of the most frustrating games ever on Nintendo. Uh, but they actually made it, and, it and, and this one is not as frustrating, and it's actually pretty cool. And the artwork is amazing. And I don't know what is the actual uh, intent from this game. It's just a really cool game. I don't know what they're gaining from it. It's just uh, they they made something for everyone, and I it's pretty cool. And that's it. That's it on <laughs> on the news. Now we're going to move on to questions. Questions from the audience because uh, people are asking questions on the chat. And uh, let's begin with the first question, Edgar. First question is, what advice do you have for self-taught graphic designers who want to go into product design? And after getting a little bit of exposure, how do you actually move towards getting your foot in the door? I guess for me, the, the thing I've seen a lot of um, portfolios, especially with more like junior candidates, is a real focus on tools. And um, so I'll see someone who's like, I'm learning Figma and I also know Sketch and I also know Framer and I also know this. And uh, I have to say in my day-to-day -day job, I think I use like Sketch and sometimes I open up Principle or something. <laughs> um, but like knowing all the tools doesn't make you a better designer. Like knowing your tool, definitely like know your stuff, but um, knowing every tool doesn't put you in a better position. So focusing more on when you're, the more junior you are, focusing more on mindset, focusing more on techniques, and getting that kind of general knowledge before you focus on like the tick, 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 tick of all the different tools, um, I think is my advice. And do you think uh, uh, that people are caring too much about tools because people are just talking about that? Uh, and they think, okay, well, I suppose I'll be, because it, it, there is an explosion of different tools out there, right? That it's just like a, yeah. every week there will be something new. I mean, right in the news, we just saw a different, uh, a new tool. Uh, so is it because of that or, is, or, or why? I mean, I guess tool, I mean, I, I can only guess. Um, yeah, I think there are, there is a lot of chatter on tools and which one's the best tool and what's the best workflow and stuff like that. Tools are kind of shiny. There's definitely like cult followings around certain tools or this tool or that tool. Um, and I also think in some ways they're a little bit more accessible. Like some of the techniques they take a lot of, um, like, understanding and learning and it takes a long time and sketch and that kind of stuff like once you kind of read a tutorial you know that skill and you can kind of check it off so i think there's a lot more um it feels a little bit nicer but it's hard to check off like ux as a skill <laughs> it's like it's a continual growing process whereas there's a finite amount of tool to learn but but unless you're learning photoshop then you're you're it's infinite you will never stop <laughs> Could tools actually help you though? Could tools actually, uh, uh, like, not just help you, uh, obviously, to get the job done, but actually uh, be more creative and things, think things in a different way? Like, uh, probably, do do you think, uh, like, opening, learning a new tool can actually make you think? Oh, now I'm going to think about animation too, because like I I'm opening Principle or I'm opening, uh, I don't know, Flinto, and now that stuff that was not in my head, like this tool is is. It's encouraging me to think in that way too. I mean, uh, totally. Like uh, knowing knowing tools is important. I would definitely say that. But for someone who's brand new, uh, I don't know if it's the most important thing is knowing the most tools. Maybe once you have a bit more experience and you want to stretch your mind a little bit more, but um, not not as a focus for someone who's like just starting out. What about you, Gabriel? You, uh, I think uh, the question was really focused about graphic design. So uh, you coming from graphic design, what do you think? Yeah, I got a hashtag for my answer. You ready? Ooh, yeah. It's going to be hashtag chase the tea. Uh, <laughs> like um, green tea, I'll, black tea. Uh, no, let me explain. Be a, be a tea <laughs> level or a tea designer. What, what is it? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think the thing that I, uh, I find people struggle with the most is that they try to do too much when they're junior designers. They're, they try to spread themselves really thin. Um, they're like, well, I can code and I can do this and I can do an icon. I can do that. Um, and I, this is something that I'm still working on today is becoming a T-shaped designer. And what, what I mean by that is somebody who's like competent at many things, but really good at one thing. And that's kind of like the bottom of the T, right? So, so as a junior designer, the hardest thing, at least for me and the, the people that I've met, is finding that one thing that they're really good at. Um, and my advice for them would be just choose one at random and, and pursue that. And then if that's not it, then ch change to another one and try that. And because as a junior designer, the one thing that you have that nobody else has is time. 
So you have a lot of time to try out a bunch of different stuff um, and find the one thing that you're really passionate about. Um, but you know, as you're presenting yourself in the portfolio and, and you're trying to craft a story behind who you are and why somebody might want to hire you, um, it should be clear what what that bottom uh, part of the T is for you. Um, and I would focus on that, finding that thing that you are really excited or really good at. What is the thing that you're really good at? Uh, I'm still finding out. I, I think it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, I like to start projects from scratch and get people behind an idea. Um, so getting momentum behind ideas and kickstarting projects, I think, is something that I'm... Um, if I don't know if I'm good at it, but I really like doing it. Could it be uh, that uh, some designers actually can do uh, two things that are probably not one thing that are the best, but two or three things that are really good, they are becoming good at? And, and actually a combination of different things. And it's just, instead of just focusing on one, I can, can that, I mean, it, it, it looks like it, that's, that's the kind of stuff that has worked for you, Gabriel. So, uh, right. So, so then why, and, and it has worked for me too. I think, uh, I'm not great at anything, but I'm able to do a lot oh, of different things. Oh, stop. Like, yeah, no, 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 way. I'm, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I, no, you I'm can't pull that, 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 that one. <laughs> Wait, no, I mean, it's I'm very clear. Is, when people I try to of... do a lot of stuff, but it, but it, but it's because of that curiosity and and that I, idea that I want to do a lot of things. And and yeah. and it's okay if I don't. Uh, I'm not the best at all of them, but it's just like a. I don't know. Like I I I I I want to. I want to disagree with what you're saying. I I want people to <laughs> well, be curious. I, I well, want to, I, I want I to try many, many things and 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 not yeah. worry about becoming you're the like best one. You're an M shape. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Down in many ways. <laughs> exactly. No, I, I think I think you should try many things. Um, and I, as a junior designer, you have the time to try those things. Just try them Got one it. at a time. Um, I see. Because um, but, but think, it's, think it's about it, the whole idea also combining different skills and creating something new sometimes with time organically. But I, I think you think you think about it from the hiring manager perspective. Very rarely do you want to hire a junior designer that's great at everything, right? You a, a team usually is made of different skills, and and each skill should be complementary of each other. And when you hire somebody new, you want there's a hole in the team that needs to be filled by a new person, right? And that hole usually comes in the shape of like, you know, somebody who's really good at prototyping or somebody who's really good at, you know, design systems or or visuals or whatever. Um, and and I think that's where junior designers can shine, right? Somebody who's really good at visuals but needs some help with prototyping or with, you know, another part of the job. Um, and and I, that to me seems like a more feasible way to approach it as opposed to like, hi, I'm a junior designer. I'm good at everything, but I don't have, I don't have a portfolio to show that's the case, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, like, so then like you're oh, you have to like, it's like Pokemon. You have to catch the right Pokemon to beat the next gym. You exactly. know, <laughs> you got to focus on what you need to do next. <laughs> I love that you made a Pokemon reference. <laughs> That is great. All the people that are like uh, younger than us are like, what, 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 what's what? that? <laughs> yeah, they're, no, they're Pokemon bringing it Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Edgar, do we have more questions? Alex Valivia, when starting in design, how would someone learn to solve problems at a deeper level other than just following tutorials? What exercises did you follow to achieve a strong mindset and foundation? I mean, really, it kind of boils down. I'm going to go back to centered, a human centered design process, right? Because that is actually what makes you a really good problem solver. So you start off with some. Well, you start off with the user, like who is the actual person that you're solving this problem for. And you really, through research, try to get to know more about the person as well as like what are the needs that they actually have. And so identifying that. So it's kind of like, what's the challenge? Um, you know, when you're building your portfolio, you can't just show something pretty. You have to kind of show your thought process between, between all of that. All right. So you have like your, your challenge and your research and you really find that need. Um, and then you start to ideate to so creating a lot of different ideas and kind of testing those, actually putting in those in front of the user. And then through that, um, you know, kind of coming up with what is your, I don't want to say final design, because of course design is never done, but the design at least that you're, you're feeling pretty comfortable to get out there um, into the, to the world and through your user. And then you actually kind of iterate based on that. So I think that that's a good process to kind of really start thinking besides just the visuals and the things that look pretty um, is just really kind of 
focusing on what is it that you're solving, the what is it the problem that you're trying to solve, and then your process on how you actually did that. And there are some resources actually that they can follow, right? That they can download at Google yeah. with this design with Google or something like that. It's, uh, I think it's. Uh, oh my gosh, I should know this. My my manager is going to be <laughs> oh like, why don't God. you why don't you know our URL? Uh, design Sprint Kit uh, dot with Google dot com. So again, that's Design Sprint Kit dot with Google dot com um, is a good, really good resource that has a lot of methodologies that kind of can walk you through on how to actually run a design sprint. Um, and think through that, that's a good way. And hey, I'll give another shout out to the show. Um, if you follow along the Centered Show, you can actually, we, that's really how we kind of put every episode of the story we're telling is really focused on the user. So we kind of set up with like, what are we trying to solve for the user and how they actually get went about and to achieve that. And you can actually learn in the process. So, um, I mean, a lot of it just comes from it, like, you know, getting your, actually doing it, which is really hard, but hopefully other designers sharing their stories on how they, not so much just even the final design, but how they got to the final design, I think is really valuable. Uh, if I can interject, I think um, there's probably two ways in which you can get to a solution. I think one, if you're intimately familiar with the problem, if it's something that affects you, then you you develop an intuition for what the solution might be. Um, so I would say follow that intuition if, if you have it. If you don't have it um, and you're, you're working on the project or a, or a problem that is foreign to you, I think the key is to uh, close the loop as, as quickly as possible between an idea and validation of that idea. And that's what the design sprint does so, so well is that it makes that, that cycle of thinking of something and validating that, that thing as quickly as possible. But, but I think in general, just avoid the thinking that, you know, you you have you will come up with a good solution, really. Like, it's just you want to be prolific and, and generative. So come up with as many solutions as possible and close the loop on um, validating those solutions with, you know, people that are intimately familiar with the problem that you're working on. Okay, we have one more question. Is there any good framework, you know, for reasoning or communicating design decisions? and how may you com improve or communicate them? I, I would ask to whom are we communicating? How do you convince people? How do you sell your idea? How do you get uh, everyone to say, yes, thumbs up or? Oh, or, one, or, one thing that comes to mind for me is like, hopefully, especially your stakeholders, um, ho ideally they're in the process with you. Like um, one of my favorite things to do is do as many sketching sessions with people that I'm actually working with that are signing off on this. So we have um, the PM in the room, we have the QAs, we have the engineers, and we're all, here's the user, here's their problem, here are constraints. Let's just sketch, let's do the crazy eights, let's work on it together. And then you have a lot less pushback and a lot less selling to do because we all kind of are there too, especially when engineers are in QA and everyone is sitting in the research sessions, watching the user go through stuff. Yeah, and, and I think uh, also the crazy eights is personal, right? You don't share the crazy eights. It's more like a practice that you do before you actually uh, put together the uh, a storyboard or something uh, like, uh, right? Or, or or do yeah. you share the cert, the crazy eights yeah. too? Yeah, the way we've okay. done the, I don't think I I don't follow the um, exact like regimented style of doing it, but uh, the way we've done it is like crazy fours or crazy eights. We fold it and then we yeah. pick a couple of our favorites and we kind of talk through those. We uh, give a quick round of feedback and then we if we have time we do a second round of sketching to kind of build off each other's and see how much we converge before. Um, then the designer kind of gets a stack of papers and kind of that's when they do their scurry off and come back with like wireframes. They're like, hey, based on all your ideas, here's what I've produced. <laughs> what, and, what feedback also, do we have? <laughs> this allows also like what uh, Edgar was saying, that uh, the louder voice is not go going to be driving the conversation and the meaning, right? Because it's a little bit more democratic, as you were saying. You put it on the board, then people vote or give their feedback, but it's not going to be one person just like, loudly just stating their opinion right and this is brings everyone together also like what you mentioned in the beginning too it's it's, it's interesting that you involve people in the early uh, in the early process it's the opposite of what gabriel was describing with the artist that goes away yeah. and then comes back with an idea if you do that just like suddenly everyone will be just a surprise. What the hell is this, right? Yeah. Who who made this decision? Why are we doing this? And and that's the worst thing that you can that can happen in, in a meeting room where suddenly you present something that you think is the best design ever, but nobody knows about it. 
and and if you didn't involve them in the beginning if you didn't like uh get them to be part of that those decisions then uh, you're toast it is actually something that happens sometimes where uh, uh some designers will be working in different teams right and then uh working in different projects and then they're like now now that i'm thinking about it that that has happened where i will be in a presentation and someone uh, a designer that, that is not uh particularly uh know about the project they will have different opinions and they will have uh, uh different kinds of views and i think it's a uh, it's a little bit of also like how do you take uh, uh feedback and how do you uh, uh gather that information and just like pres like come back and just like try again uh, uh this is one of those things that uh, I, I think uh, you just get better at just like just the, the act of speaking and just like selling your idea not selling your idea but also just like uh, presenting the solution that you everyone came up with uh, it's it's something also that uh, you need to practice a lot, and you need to uh, get that get in those uh, moments that are a little bit uncomfortable, and and where you're you you have to be the one defending uh, that solution. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I, sometimes yeah. for for that specific, it's just practice. I think. I I think you should uh, um, you should avoid defending your work as much as possible. Um, like the the moment you you find yourself defending it is because you feel that it's being attacked, and I think that's just a uh, not a great dynamic. Um, I, I think the best way to prove that an idea is bad is to design it and to make it and to show it, right? So if somebody else in the room has a different idea, I think it's a designer's job to visualize that idea and and take that feedback and say, okay, yes, let's let's design that, and then and now we talk about both ideas as you know physical things that we can react to. Um, and if there isn't consensus in the room, you know, again, the, the the problems that you're solving are likely not for the people in that room. So you let the people who are intimately familiar with that problem actually come up with a better solution. I want to thank everyone that is here and asking questions. And uh, uh, we're going to be doing this every week. Uh, uh, hopefully you join us. And, and that's it. Quick question. Oh, Somebody another question. You to plug Yasmin's show because they wanted the Google resources. So, oh yeah. So, uh, please, Yasmin, uh, tell the, us all about your show. The, center, the the URL for the Center Show is yt.be/centered. yt.be/centered. Uh, if you follow me, I think my Twitter is in is on there right like if you go on twitter i'll read out the chat lets you put in links yeah YouTube chat i'll add those there. links in the description too okay cool. uh, any other links that you want to share chantal something probably plan great <laughs> we're hiring construction's fun come work with me your your team sounds pretty amazing actually <laughs> i really i think it's like y'all y'all have your your stuff together awesome. yeah, we have a lot of fun it's it's a good place <laughs> what are you gabriel what do you want to where do you want people to go and click uh, i have absolutely nothing to do with this website but i think everyone should go to seeherparty.com um it's a great website for uh visualizing and getting music for your party seeherparty.com <laughs> that's awesome you i go. love your plug <laughs> <laughs> Is it, do they have okay. good music for the crazy eights? So the way it works is you you put in three nouns, uh, like you put a you put in a uh, an artist and then three nouns, and it just loops gifts of those three nouns over and over again while playing SoundCloud. <laughs> That's amazing. It's, it's amazing. amazing. Crazy eights. Go... <laughs> yeah, you can do that. <laughs> Who would the artist be though? Ooh. That's a good one. <laughs> Pablo Stanley, obviously. Of course. <laughs> Muy, muy. Thank you so much. I'm gonna end it there. See you next week. Goodbye, all 50 people. <laughs> <laughs> it's just live. They're gonna get more. <laughs>